Hello, everybody. Welcome to Our Best Days Are Yet Ahead. I hope you are doing well wherever you are in the world. I wanted to come on here to bring forth to you a study that I've been doing that the Lord has put on my heart, and it it's regarding salt and light. And I know many of us are very familiar with the passage. However, when I was led to this particular passage, and, and, and again, I felt led to do an in-depth study with it, I started finding some pretty amazing things, and they were so amazing that I, I just felt led to make a presentation out of it, and I want to bring forth that information to you in the hopes of edifying you in your daily walk, and giving you some things to think about that maybe um, you didn't think about before. And again, this this message is about the salt and light, and basically what Jesus was talking about. So as we go through this um, passage or this study, I kind of want, I've got three goals in mind for us today. And basically what they are, and we're going to be looking at Matthew 5, uh, 13 through 16. Uh, Mark 9, 49 through 50, and Luke 14, 34 through 35. So again, going back to the goals for this study, I want us to be able to look at these passages and answer the question of who Jesus is talking about, because that's important. Answer the question of what Jesus is referring to when he's speaking about the salt and the light. And lastly, answer the how the scripture can be applied in our daily lives. So before we get into all those things, I want to first address the properties and uses of salt, which are very important. You know, when we look at scripture, the Lord uses certain things to convey messages. And there are often deep hidden meetings that go into the message that he is trying to communicate. And the deeper you go, the more fruitful they are. And they all speak, and they all speak the same thing. That's what's so amazing about our Lord. He, 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 he doesn't just speak in one way. He speaks in all ways, and they all point to the same truth. And they're all fruitful, and they are just so beautiful in its richness and its glory. And, oh, man. Sorry, I got off on a tangent there. But anyways, um, properties, uses of salt. Okay, so the first thing I want to address is pure salt. Pure salt is natural. And in its natural state, it's white in color, which is a, it's symbolic of purity. It is extremely stable, which is also symbolic, so it's kind of interesting. But here's, here's the main thing, and I want you to hold on to this. Pure salt cannot lose its flavor. Hold on to that. Pure salt cannot lose its flavor. Again, hold on to this. It's also made up of small crystal-like structures that reflect light. Hold on to this as well. Okay. Now, let's talk about unnatural salt. For example, table salt or salt from the sea. Okay. Unnatural salt can lose its flavor under certain conditions, but only when the salt was already impure. What I mean by that is in its first state, its first original state, it was already impure. Okay. Then, in that circumstance, it can lose its flavor. But on the contrary, pure salt in its original state cannot lose its flavor. Okay, let's, let's use a couple examples here. So when additives are added to the salt, this means it can lose its flavor over time. So again, that's why I use the example of table salt, because there are additives added to it. 
um, and over time it can lose its flavor. Another example is C, the C, which is also salty. And, you know, if we think about the story of Jesus walking on the water, and if we also think about the story of where Jesus approached the fishermen and said, come follow me and cast your net and bring in the fish, which we are symbolic of the fish, but the sea is a typology for the world. But isn't it interesting that the sea is also salty? Okay, and we cannot drink salt water. Well, again, the sea is a typology for the world. Well, if you look deeper into that message and into the typology for the world, the, the uh, salty sea, you start getting the impression and understanding, additional understanding, that the salt that is within the sea is unnatural and is impure, and it symbolizes worldly intentions, okay? which will lose its flavor. Again, richness, just little nuggets that all point to the same thing. Love it. Anyways, okay, moving forward. Salt is also a preservative. It is also a preservative. Number four, it has cleaning properties. And number five, it heals wounds. So, when he's saying, you know, being the, being the salt and the light, you know, it, it, the truth stings at first. You know, while it's working, while that truth is working, it kills all that bacteria, kills all the uncleanness, but it ends up healing in the end, you know. So it's, it, I hope you're starting to, as we're kind of going through the properties of salt, I hope you're starting to make connections with it, and hopefully you're getting a better um, understanding and some clarity as to what Jesus is talking about. And as we go through it, we'll continue, we'll continue making that known. Okay. Also, the other thing, at the time that Jesus was on the earth, salt was used as a commodity and it was used for so many different things. Um, and it was highly valuable. Not only that, but it was used also for wages. You know, that's something that a lot of people don't know. And so with that being said, what is Jesus saying? You are the salt of the earth. One, you're rare. And two, you were bought and paid for at a great price. At a great price. Jesus bought and paid our sin debt for a great price. And our value is great. And he's basically saying don't lose sight. Of your value um, because we have the Holy Spirit within us we have the truth that is living inside of us so you are the salt of the earth you are highly valuable okay and also did you also know this is something that I learned that I thought was just amazing the word salt actually means salary okay salt come comes from the Latin word Sal, or Saul, depending on how you pronounce it, which is where the word salary comes from. So salt literally means salary or wages. Isn't that amazing? I know. That's what I said. Okay, anyways, moving forward. Number seven. The term salt of the earth at the time was also used to describe as a person held in high esteem. So again, that kind of goes with Point number six, what I was talking about. Um, when Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth, don't forget your value. You are valuable. Um, you were bought and paid for at a great price. Um, so understand that you are rare. Um, and again, also understand that you are, as a believer, held to a higher standard. Um, and you are great in, um, in a not great as in the flesh, meaning he's talking about the spirit here. So you are great in terms of your worth and your value. Okay, and also number eight here. Salt was used, and it's still used to this day, as a flavor enhancer. It accents the flavor of meat, brings out the individuality of vegetables, 
deepens the flavor of dessert, puts oomph into bland starches, and develops the flavors of melons and other fruits. So it deepens us. The salt brings out certain things. It puts oomph into us. It allows fruit to basically develop. Isn't that interesting? I hope you're starting to make connections there just with that. Okay. Now, before we move forward into the actual text and verses, I want to also address how salt was used in the Old Testament. Now, because this will provide a lot of clarity as to what Jesus was talking about and how all of this will come back home. Okay. So, Salt was used in offerings for sacrifices. You can find this throughout the Old Testament. Um, and specifically, all offerings and sacrifices were sprinkled with salt, as this made it more acceptable to the Lord, as it created a sweet-smelling aroma. You know, as we read in Leviticus 2.13, which says, And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant. It's an interesting salt of the covenant. Could that be a reference to a future covenant that was to be created? Absolutely. He's talking about Jesus here. Um, of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. And there's other scriptures to consider for further study. And I have them listed here for you. But the key point here is... Salt was used as a, was added to a, an offering, and it made it more pleasing to the Lord. Um, and they used it for all things. And again, that's important as we move forward to kind of have that in the back of your mind. Okay, if we look at Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And if we use comparative scriptures of the same message, um, going to Mark 9, 49 through 50, for everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. And you've got the same basically the same reiteration um, in Luke's gospel as well. But again, if we're, we're, if we're looking at all these things, we need to look further, we need to look deeper, taking into consideration the properties of salt that we looked at or the, earlier, but also we need to do a word analysis. We're, we're seeing verbiage such as season. Well, what does that mean? You know, the Bible talks about lean not on your own understanding. So as we're doing a study, no matter what it is, we don't want to inadvertently put our own understanding or use our own preconceived not notions to put our own bias within the Word. We want to take Scripture and allow it to speak for itself. That's why praying before reading scripture is so important. Um, I'm a huge proponent of that. And, you know, we want, as I said before, we want the word to speak for itself. And we want the, we want scripture to confirm scripture. We don't want to inadvertently put our own preconceived notions into it. Because when we do that, we're, we, we can get on the wrong track. We can. Um, but anyway, so let's look at Matthew 5.13 a little bit more closely. So you are the salt of the earth. So from our 
previous study on what the uses of salt are and what that verbiage is at the time period it was said. During Jesus' time, the Lord is saying, you are held in high esteem. You are valuable. You were bought for at a price. And he's also talking to you as in believers. In this first part, he's talking to believers. Okay? Then key word here follows. But if, if is a big word. Okay? The salt loses its flavor. In other words, unnatural salt. He's referring to unnatural salt. He's not referring to pure salt. He's now talking to a different group at this point. Okay? How shall it be seasoned? And if we look at this word seasoned in the Strong's Concordance, it's G233, Halizo, or even in Luke's account, it's Ar Arterio, G741. It means to salt, means seasoned with salt, it means sprinkled with salt. So he's using it in the in a um, in the Old Testament way of sacrifices is what he's using it for. And if you look at the words shall it be, it's used in a future tense, this word seasoned, and that's very important when looking at what Jesus is talking about here. He's using it in a way that yields to discipleship. He's more talking about discipleship than he is about salvation. But there is a salvation tie into it because you can't have discipleship if you're not truly saved. So there is that tie into it. But again, as we, we understand this scripture and we look deeper, it's important to understand that this is used in a future tense. Um, and when you go further into the text, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He's saying that if you are, if you're made up of unnatural salt, you are good for nothing. Basically, it's not good for anything. Your discipleship will be nothing because you weren't truly saved, if that makes sense. Now, let's further go into it a little bit more here. So, again, we want to ask ourselves, as we're looking through this scripture, who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to two sets of people at the same time. Okay, by you are the salt of the earth. He's talking to believers, but he's also talking to non-believers, but with specificity, professing believers. We need to ask ourselves, who, what does the salt represent? Okay, The salt, if you're looking at Old Testament and you're looking at what the Lord is using this for, the salt represents two things. It's a representation of the truth, which is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which you can only get if you truly believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and also what your intentions are in receiving the gospel, and also your intentions with your daily lives or daily walk. Okay. So again, believers have the pure salt. They cannot lose its flavor. Let me repeat that again. Believers cannot, true believers cannot lose its flavor. As intentions of their heart are pure and they truly believe in the gospel. Which in turn, when it comes to their discipleship, they will produce through the Holy Spirit fruit in the future. And it will be good fruit. In the second half of this verse, whereas it says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? The second half of the verse only implies if intentions in daily situations are not pure. But in terms of salvation, it doesn't apply. So I hope you're understanding that the pure salt, meaning it cannot lose its flavor, is solidifying once you truly believe you are saved. It's done. Okay, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing on itself. Okay, now 
let's address the second half of this part, the, the dual meaning here. Non-believers, he's also talking to non-believers, specifically professing believers. They are the unnatural salt. They can lose its flavor. Now, again, as we, I want to clarify uh, once again, because I want to make sure that this is understood. It's about initial intentions. It's about original state. Initial state. In its first state, pure salt cannot lose its flavor. Again, initial state, original state. Additives or unnatural salt in its first state, in its original state, can lose its flavor over time. Okay, again, I want to make sure that that's clear. All right, moving forward. Non-believers, specifically professing believers, they have worldly intentions, meaning their intentions of their heart are not pure. Therefore, the salt that they have inside of them will lose its flavor over time. And if those intentions are not pure, that person will not produce fruit, nor will they be good for anything regarding the kingdom. And therefore, the second half of this verse applies. The second half being it is then good for nothing, and it will be true. It'll be trampled and thrown out underfoot by men. Okay? It's very interesting stuff. Very interesting. Now, when we look at this, how can this be applied? There's, a, there's an additional part to this that I want to bring forth. And if we look at the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's little subtleties of difference that add clarity and meaning. When if you put them all together and you study them individually, it, it, you get further context and further depth and further meaning into the whole thing. And what I want to specifically point out in Mark's account is the word fire. Okay, so again, talking to two different sets of believers. Okay, you've got the pure salt and you've got the unnatural salt. Okay, again, it goes into intentions. What are your intentions? And it's all dependent upon the heart. God weighs the heart. We as individuals cannot see the heart. Only God sees the heart. Okay. So in verse 49, when he is talking about, for everyone will be seasoned with fire. Okay. This is going into the sacrifice. Not only is Jesus talking about himself being the sacrifice for the atonement of all sin. But he's also talking about how when we believe, we are then living sacrifices made unto God. So, isn't that amazing? He's talking both ways, it's, but they all lead to the same thing. It's, it's so amazing. I love how God talks. But anyways, so going back to fire. All right, there's fire in terms of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is adding more clarity into what the salt actually represents. And the Holy Spirit is the truth. Jesus, the Son, Father, which is God, and Holy Spirit, which is Spirit. Which the Holy Spirit not only justifies us, but also sanctifies us over time. We are created in a new creature, in a new, the new man. Okay? But also there's the fire from refinement, which only comes through trials and tribulations. You know, at first there's a rock, you know, which is indicative of our, of our daily lives. And over time, over trials, over tribulations, God refines us into making us that diamond, the diamond that shines so bright, right? Okay, so there's two, two things there. Now, when you're looking at the professing believers, the fire that he's talking about is in reference to judgment. That's why when he says for everyone, he's talking to all believers, non-believers and believers alike. So, and again, their worldly intentions, their intentions are not pure. They're based off of the world. Again, the typology of the salty sea, which is made up of unnatural salt. Okay. So I kind of made a graphic for you to kind of 
hopefully make this a little bit clearer and just to give you a visual of what I'm talking about. So again, at the center you have salt, which is again representation of the truth, which is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and your intentions. Okay, which again, those are intentions upon uh, that are based upon the heart. Okay, it's about heart. God weighs the heart. All right. And the question, the side question of that, are they pure? Are the intentions pure? And this is the difference between natural salt, pure salt, or unnatural salt. Okay. Again, that ties into salvation and discipleship. If you are truly saved, you're going to have natural salt. You're going to have pure salt. If you're not saved, but doing it in vain, you're going to have unnatural salt. And you'll be good for nothing. Okay, but when you do have the true salt, the 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 pure salt, what it does, the Holy Spirit working in and through you, it not only cleanses you, it washes you, but it heals you. Okay, which also preserves you. We are preserved through the Holy Spirit with His truth and His glory and His righteousness and His love and joy. And then in that it feeds on itself, which creates more flavor, which produces good fruit. It enhances our fruit, which is all done through Holy Spirit, all done through Jesus. All of it's done through Him, which in turn affects our discipleship and affects our overall effectiveness in terms of our daily walk and our daily lives. Again, this all comes back to Jesus. We are the temple of God. And when we are true, when we have that pure salt, it reflects light. And the light that is in us is Jesus. He's telling us to seek him. He's telling us to reflect the light that's in you. Which again, it only comes from the Holy Spirit. only comes from Jesus. It's not of ourselves. It doesn't come from us. It only comes from God. And that is why we are so valuable as believers is because we are rare. There are so few people out there in the world that truly believe in the finished work of Jesus at the cross. So few do. But when you do, you when you come across a person that does truly believe they're different, they light up, they're the light of the world. It's, it's amazing. And again, I hope this graphic kind of brings home everything that I'm talking about. And Again, the Lord is so fruitful in everything that he says, and it, it all feeds together, and it all, it all makes sense, you know? It's, it's beautiful. Anyways, side note there again, get off on a tangent. Um, but anyway, so as we finish up, as I try to wrap this up here, the key takeaways here is Jesus speaks in more than one way, but they all speak the same truth. And that's what's so beautiful. You know, I, I find that a lot of people, and, and I'm guilty of this sometimes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not immune to this by any means, but we look at the text and the scripture and we, we think it only means one thing. Well, that's not true. The more you study, the more you get the understanding, receive the understanding that he actually is speaking in more than one way. But he also, when you look at that, he's speaking in, in such a way that they all lead to the same thing. And that's what's so beautiful and poetic about it. Um, and the other key takeaway here is salt and light is a description of how we should be as, as children of God, as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. It's a description and a call to action of how we should walk with the Lord. And this particular text is speaking more about discipleship, but has a salvation tie into it. Um, and again, the salt is a representation of the truth, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But also the dual representation there is it also is representation of a person's intentions. Are they pure? or impure. And again, this goes into salvation, which in turn affects your discipleship. So it all feeds together. Um, and again, I certainly hope that in this study that we did together, that you were edified 
and you can use these things to um, help you with your daily lives and um, apply them to your life and hopefully um, get a better understanding as to who Jesus is and the love he has for us. And I just pray that you were edified today. Again, um, I'll be doing some more teachings here in the future. If you have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out. If there's a particular passage in scripture that you're struggling with, um, put them in the description box, or excuse me, put them in the comments below, um, and I'll try to make a teaching out of it. The other thing too is please like, subscribe, share this video with everybody you know so that they may be edified. Um, and again, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.